today we are doing three chapters. Three chapters, I've combined them because there is a linkage, which is emotion, cognition, as well as memory. We're focusing on emotion, cognition, and there is memory. Those are the key chapters that you are doing today. So before we start, as always, before we start, let's just show our understanding of the key concepts of the key concept that is emotion, cognition, and memory. You cannot continue to, your, with your chapter. You cannot start without defining these words for yourself. Firstly, you, you, you take your study material. Before you complete studying, you, you, st you start to study, you define the terminologies. The terminology is number one, emotion, cognition, and memory. Those are the three key topics. Emotion and memory. Emotion and memory. The link. One cannot discuss about emotion without touching on what? Without touching on motivation. There is a linkage between emotion and motivation. We did discuss motivation, human motivation, under PYC 1502. So by now, I'm sure you know the meaning of the term motivation. So let's do this to kick out, kick, kick start the class. What is your understanding of the term emotion? Before we continue, what's your understanding of the term emotion? The way I, the way I think it is, it's a, it's a conscious mental reaction. Like it, it responds to certain experiences that one feels and events. Okay, thanks very much. It, 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 it's a controlled reaction, meaning it comes up when there's a reaction. Something needs to trigger it, and you react through emotions. That's what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Reven. Thanks very much. That's it. No one died. Let's continue from emotion. Thanks very much, Reven. So let me give you a definition of emotion. So we start from here. They say, Reven said, emotion is a, is a feeling that is triggered by something for you to say, yeah, emotional. For you to feel something means it has been triggered by something. So let's let's check here. Emotion. Emotion refers to the experiences of feelings of such such as what? Such as fear, joy, anger, anxiety. Emotions activate and affect behavior. That's a key, def key definition of emotion. So let me open the recommended book so that I, I can be much broader. Yes. It says, let me give you a background. It says, every day, every day of our lives, we experience a variety of what? Emotions. Every day of our lives, we experience a variety of emotions. Emotions are one type of feeling. Either you say emotion or feeling. Emotions are feelings that are clearly linked to a meaning of the particular situation. They say emotions are clearly linked to a particular situation. Like Reven said, for you to say, you are feeling emotional, or for, for us to see that something is, is, is triggered your behavior, something is not well with your behavior today. Either you are sad, something is angered you, or you're experiencing anxiety. It could be that they say emotions are feelings that are clearly linked to a meaning of a particular situation. The way in which people express themselves, describe, define, or recognize their emotions is related to what? To several factors. Factors could be such as situation they are in, age-related, gender, cultural factors. Those are keys that can affect your emotion. They say age-related, gender, factors. Why do they say age-related? A, a person who's 18 years old compared to a person who's 6 years old, they experience emotions differently. They, they, challenge, they challenge life differently, meaning what you challenge an 18-year-old is different from what you challenge a 6-year-old. And their reaction to, that, 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 to the effects that trigger their behavior, their behavior differs. Then they say age-related, gender-related also differs. They continue by saying emotion needs to move. Emotion what? Mean to move. For example, an emotion may move us to do something. An emotion may move us to do something. For instance, 
you decided to to attend the class. You make sure that by 18, 18 00, 6 o'clock, I need to make sure that I attend Sezwani's class. Why did you attend the Sezwani class? Because you want to what? To pass the exam. What type of, type of emotion is related to you passing the exam? Number one is anxiety. You are writing your, your exams. You're starting to be anxious. You are curious what will come up after the paper. What will come out? Uh, what for content will come out? How can I manage my exams? I know most of you are writing five exams per semester. How can I manage my team table? Therefore, in order to manage my studies, I need to attend the class because of anxiety. Some it could be fear. You don't want to fail. Joy, you can also apply joy. You've been studying for so long. Now you, are, you feel like you are ready. It's joyfulness. Yes, they say an emotion may move us to do something. So an emotion may move us to do something. So as individuals, we are, we are physical hu human beings. Physical is in our body. Psychological, psychological, that's where you include your emotions, feeling. We are spiritual beings. So all those aspects take into play. However, for now, we we'll focus on that emotion, which is related to psychological well-being. Then continue by saying, like fear, fear may move us to run away from a danger. Fear may, may, may trigger us to run away from danger. You are walking in the street side and you see a snake. Instantly, you run away. Why are you running away? Because you know the snake. You have psychological experiences about the snake. So you decide to run away. That is triggered by what? An emotion. What type of feeling? Fear. They say emotions activate and affect behavior. Emotions activate and affect behavior. What do they mean when they say emotion activates behavior? Like we said here, you are writing an exam. We are curious. We are anxious through emotions. We are curious and anxious. Then your behavior will be activated as to the plan, the plan of action. I need to study, meaning your behavior is activated. I need to attend classes. Your behavior is activated. I need to buy enough data. Your behavior is activated. And they say it affects behavior. Remember, behavior alone is non existent unless there are emotions in it. When you decide to fight someone now, you get angry. You decide to fight someone, meaning the effects of your emotions affect your behavior. Your behavior is using your hands, throwing fists. Kicking someone, meaning your emotions has affected your behavior, has activated and affected your behavior. That's the definition of emotion. In short, they say it refers to the experiences of emotions of such such as fear, joy, anger, anxiety, emotion, emotions activate and affects behavior. So before you go any further, that's what you need to do. You break down the concept emotion. Remember, we are we are psychology students. Whether you are doing social work, however, psychology students, because you are doing psychological modules, human behaviorist. So, if any students from engineering or a student from business management comes to you and say, "What's your understanding of emotion?" You need to be clear. You need to be precise because that is what that's what you are specializing in. Any form of a problem, any challenge, if the clients come to you. Definitely we're dealing with emotions. Regardless of the situation, there are emotions in it. Then motivation. Why emotion and motivation? How do the two links? They say motivation refers to an internal state that activates and gives direction to our thoughts, feelings, and, and actions. They say emotion, motivation refers to an internal state that activates and gives direction. Do you see here? They say emotion activates behavior, emotion activates behavior. Same here, they say, it refers to an internal state that activates, gives direction to our thoughts, motivating, motivation. The reason you are studying is because you want to achieve something. You want to be a better person. Better person how? Perhaps you are motivated by finances. You want to have money, you value money. 
perhaps are motivated by other uh, uh, material aspects. Like you value having a beautiful house, you value having a house, having a family, having a, your beautiful car, you, or you value adding, you, you, value, you value contributing to a society. Your goal is to, your vision is to help the community. Your goal is to help people cope with their problems. That's where it starts, meaning you have a goal. For you to achieve a goal, they say, it starts from the mind. Then you apply this concept to motivation, say, refer to the internal state. The internal state is something that you cannot, we can't see. It's an internal state, meaning it's within you, it's inside. You cannot see it. However, we can only see it once it's activated. So refer to an internal state, that's a motivation, your goal, your ambition. Activate and give direction to our thoughts. Give direction to our thoughts. That could be, how am I, am, how am I going to achieve my goal? That is thoughts. There are feelings. As soon as you, you do something, either that you love or you want to achieve something, you cannot run away from what? From the feeling. Because once you fail to achieve it, you become sad. Once you achieve it, you become happy. There are challenges as well in the process of achieving it, that is feelings. And action, action, taking that decision to go to any academic institution or UNISA to be precise and register for your qualification. Making sure that you attend the classes, you buy your study material, that is what? Action. So refer to the internal state. Internal state is something that you cannot see, the goal within you, the, the goal needs to, to, to be activated. Once it's activated, you need to give direction to our thoughts. Now, our thoughts, planning, feelings, ambitions, whether it is a good one, it goes with your feelings, and action, deliberate action. Then a motivation is a specific need or desire that arouses the organism. A motive is a specific need, a specific need or desire that arouses what? An organism. And, and directs its behavior towards a goal, a motive, a goal in mind, a, what you want to achieve. We call it a motive. A motive is a specific need. A specific need in, the, in this instance, we said, it's your goal to achieve something. Also, a need could be sim a, simple things like uh, the need to go to the toilet, the need to go to, to eat. Let's assume currently you are feeling hungry. Then the motive will be, a motive is a specific need, a specific need internally, what you want to achieve, what is that you want to achieve, you, you want to fulfill hunger, you want to eat, then the desire that arouses the organism and directs its behavior towards a goal. So a motive, internal motive, the need to eat, that is number one, a need to go to the toilet, or a desire that arouses the organism and direct its behavior towards the goal. They say it directs its behavior towards the goal. Behavior will direct uh, you are hungry. The behavior that directs the need to a goal is you preparing something to eat, preparing food to eat. A motive, a specific need, a need that you have a goal in mind, desire that arouses, a desire that arouses, you need to eat. It directs your behavior, how it directs your behavior you by you, you taking an action, making food, organizing food for yourself, that is simply direct towards the goal. So you see, the more you study, the more you come up with practical as aspects. So you don't need just you don't need to study without using examples. So I'm making much easier for you. All motives are triggered by stimuli. In this instance, what is the stimuli? The stimuli, anything that triggers your behavior. It could be from internally or externally. Anything that triggers your behavior, either internally or externally. Externally, the need to study for exam, the need to buy a car, that is, is what mostly is external, because something that is tangible, you'll get your qualification, is tangible. Then there are stimuli that come from inside, from, we cannot see, the need to go to the toilet. It's a stimuli, however, you can't see it, because it's from in, inside, Hunger is from inside. So that's the difference between the two. Motives, they share what? They share feelings. Motivation, there's feelings. Emotion, there's feelings as well. 
They say both motives, then what is similar? They are closely linked. These two concepts are closely linked together. Both motives and the arousal of emotion activates the behavior. What is what's the difference between the two? Or what is similar? What is similar is that both motives and the arousal of emotion activates what? They activate behavior. Both of them, they activate behavior. In, in what sense? The first one. Motive the need to achieve something, they activate behavior. Meaning, as soon as you experience this need, whether the need is from internally or externally, you want to fix it. You are thirsty, you are looking for water, you want to drink water. Instantly, you go and pour water for yourself. You go pour water from, for yourself, that is the first one, motive. Then there's what? The arousal of emotions activates behavior. The arousal of emotion activates behavior. You're feeling sad. Once you feel sad, what you do, you can see it from your, from your facial. You can see it from the way you express yourself, that you are really sad. Something is affecting your behavior. That is, emotions activates behavior. So both motivation and emotion activates what's behavior. Motives are often accompanied by what emotions. Any form of motive is accompanied by emotion. Your goal, you want to achieve something, is accompanied by emotion. You are feeling sick and you want to kill yourself, is accompanied by what? By emotion. Emotions typically have motivational properties of their own. They further say emotions typically have motivational properties of their own. So once you master this, you master this, it will be simpler for you to differentiate between what is emotions and what is motivation. So these questions is likely to come in, come up in an exam. You differentiating between what is motive, motivation as well as what is emotion. Firstly, you need to look at the similarities. Both they have feelings in it. Feelings, feelings, influenced by what what you are thinking, your thoughts, thoughts. Also, this your interpretation of the problem that makes you much uh, feeling more, uh, emotional thoughts. They both affect what behavior. They both affect behavior. Like I said, both your motives and arousal of, emo of emotion activates behavior. Motives are often accompanied by what emotions. Emotions typically have motivational properties of their own. Then we move to the next slide. The next slide says, for you to master the concept of emotion you need to look at what classifications of emotion you see classifications of emotion classification could be the category of emotion the differences within emotions categories the categorization of emotions so emotion is divided into what into five chapters emotions and motivation Classification of emotion, concept of emotion, theories of emotion, as well as emotional intelligence. Lastly, interpretation of emotion. For now, we are focusing on what? Classification of emotion. How does the, the concept of emotion is broken down? How can you break down the, the concept of emotions? We have primary emotions, followed by secondary emotions, positive and negative emotions, internally and ex externally expressed emotions, as well as emotions of various intensities. So let's start with primary emotions. Primary emotion, the beginning, the start. Primary emotions. Primary emotions are those emotions shared by people throughout the world, regardless of their culture. They say we call them primary emotions. Primary emotions are those emotions shared by people throughout the world regardless of the culture. What do they mean? There are eight primary emotions. Fear. Fear is fear. The way Chinese uh, describe fear is similar to how Africans describe fear. So fear is fear. When something good in danger, you feel fear. When you feel like something is threatening your, your well-being, you fear. So we share commonality. The, the interpretation is, all, is the same. A surprise. A surprise is a surprise. When you say to someone, surprise, 
the explanation is the same. The surprise is someone when you want to cheer someone unexpectedly, meaning it's a surprise. Then you say sadness. Sadness, grievance is similar, similar interpret, interpretation. Discuss, anger, antip, anticipation, the joy and acceptance. The interpretation of these terms is the same from culture to culture. You can go to Chinese culture, African culture, uh, um, Asians, you can go to German. These terms are, are the same. Fear is fear, surprise is surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, and joy. Yes, you call them primary emotions because you share the same meaning. They say primary emotions are those emotions that are shared by people throughout the world, regardless of their culture. Then, how to identify primary emotions? The question is how to identify primary emotions? How to identify it? They say, they must be they must be evident in all cultures they must be evident in all cultures meaning the issue of fear the issue of anger must be interpreted the same in various cultures anger is anger in all cultures not in some cultures but in all cultures fear is fear they must contribute to survival you have to ask yourself, what do they mean by that they must contribute to, to the survival? So it means they must contribute to survival. Our ways, our ways of living. When someone, a close person passes away. When someone close person passes away, we expect you to what? To be said. When someone buy the house or a car, the feeling that you expect that the person is, is joyful, is happy. Yes, they say they must contribute to survival. We live by crying, we live by being sad, we live by being excited, happy. It's part of our, of our well-being, it's part of our well-being. Yes, they say they must contribute to survival. If someone got hit by a car, you feel sad, you don't laugh, because that is a, it's evident to all cultures. They must contribute to survival. They say they must be associated with distinct facial expression. They must be associated with distinct facial expression. If you say something to, to me, perhaps you are sharing a sad story. I need to see sadness in your face. If you are joyful, I need to see joy in your face. Meaning, what they are saying, need to link with your facial expression. If it does not link with your facial expression, you won't make sense to me. You have to have a term like sarcasm, being sarcastic. They must be associated with distinct facial expression. What you are saying, you are telling me that you are happy because you have passed your exam. However, we are, we are, we can see from your face that you are, you are sad. Meaning it does not balance. They must be evident in non-human species. They also say primary emotions, they must be evident in non-human species. What do they mean by non-human species? Primary emotions like fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, anticipation, joy, acceptance must also be evident in non-human species. Non-human species, we're thinking of animals. They're saying these emotions are also evident in an human species, so that's true. Animals, each year, like a dog. Let's assume that in your household, there is someone lost his or her life. You are planning what? A funeral, a burial. You will notice that most of the time, animals, animals that you are close to, they will see from emotion, they will feel it, that something's wrong in this house. How do you see it? They won't get excited that like they used to. Normally, animals will, come, will even comfort you. They'll come sit next to you as a form of a comfort because they also born with what? With emotions. They are emotional non species. They are emotional beings as well, animals. That's why 
if an animal passes away, yes, they also grieve. Yes, they say there must be evidence in a human species this primary. Dog also experiences fear. Yes, they run away when they see a threat. When they get sad, when another animal passes away, yes, they get angry if you playing around in your territory. But imagine lions and elephants playing around their territory. They get anger, angry. Then they'll show you <laughs> flames. That is, there must be evidence in non-human species, not only in humans. Moving on, we discussed the primary of the key eight. Then secondary emotion, they say to us, secondary emotions are those that are found in some cultures, but not in all cultures. Secondary emotions are type of emotions that, that are found in some cultures, but not in all, all, in all cultures. They may be considered as the various combinations of primary emotions as influenced by cultural background. So from culture to culture, emotion, uh, the way we, we portray, we express our emotions differ. They say secondary emotions. From culture to culture, the way we express our emotions, what? It differs to, to some extent. You see, yeah, they say it, they must be evident in all cultures, meaning primary emotion, the expression is the same. Fear is fear, sadness is sadness, surprise is surprise. However, in secondary emotion, they say, no, 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 no. Secondary emotions are those that are found in some cultures, but not in all, in all of them. They may be considered as various combinations of primary emotion, as well as, an, as influenced by cultural what background. Then let's look at those emotions that support what the secondary culture. So you'll find in some in some cultures, for instance, when the child is born, when the child is born, the newborn, after conception, is born to earth, you'll find in some cultures, instead of celebrating, some they cry. Why are they crying? Because they know that the child was in a better place, better place where in the womb. Now he or she is out and the world is not good or the world is not good enough. The way they feel that the world is evil, the world is, is, is a place for suffering. Then the expression is crying. That's how they, they view their, their, what? their emotions. So ring what we call ilobolo. The proposal, a, a form of a marriage, wedding, you will find there are mixed emotions in those aspects. Some will cry that I'm losing my child now. Some will get happy, will get overly happy. That either my son or my daughter has men up, has men up, is moving to a greater place. So we express emotions. If they say secondary emotion are those that are found in some cultures but not in other cultures. You, you will find that in some cultures they say men don't cry. Men don't cry. Only females should express their emotions and cry. Again, it's from what? Culture to culture. We are not saying it's wrong, we are not saying it's right. But it's how they, they, they present themselves. That's how they learn how to survive. The men doesn't cry. The tigers don't cry. Only females, meaning secondary emotions are those that are found in some cultures, but they do not found in, in other cultures. They what? They differ, in short. Then positive and negative emotions. Positive and negative emotion, this side, this is one one, because almost the same thing, it's an opposite. Primary emotions versus secondary emotions. They are neighbors. So this is the second aspect. They say positive and negative emotions. Emotions, we have negative emotions and positive emotions. What do we mean by positive emotions? Positive emotions are associated with what? Joy, love, acceptance, and are usually experienced as pleasurable and rewarding. Those are positive feelings. Passing your exam is a pleasant feeling. It gives you hope. It makes you excited. Then negative emotions are usually experienced as unpleasant, I usually experience as unpleasant, something unexpected or something that triggers your emotions negatively. 
that is internal. That is positive and negative emotion. So you see, these two are straight to the point. Then we have what? Internal and external expressed emotion. Internal and ex in ex external expressed emotion. Normally, you can see when a person is happy, you can see if a person is what? Is sad through emotion. They say emotions are expressed and recognized in different ways. Emotions are expressed and recognized in different ways. Physiological changes are internal expression of emotion. Physiological changes. Physiologically is a physical aspect, however, internally. E.g., when, when you are sad or something angers you, what happens to your body? Blood pressure goes high. Your breathing rate goes high. Remember, you are fighting, your, your breathing rate becomes much quicker. The beep is too much. Blood pressure high. What will happen to the blood screen? Blood screen, there's too much blood flow because they are angered. Those are what? Physiological changes that happen internally. Particularly when, when the, the high intensity of, stim, of stimulation. So in, in the, most here we are referring to the organs and the vessels. Internally, particularly when you are angry, blood pressure goes high, is internal, you cannot see it, but you can measure it. We, can, we cannot see your, your lungs pumping, your brain rate goes high, however it happens, it's physiological, it's inside. Your heart rate again goes high. Blood pressure flows to express what? To express your emotion. That's why some people, when they're angry, you even see veins in their face. Even animals, when they're angry, you see veins in their face. That is the internal. Then you have what? Emotions can be expressed externally. Through what words? Emotion can be expressed externally through words. When you start swearing, same way, certain, saying certain things. Anger, frustration can lead to verbal expressing of swearing, shouting at someone. I won't mention any popular words that they normally say once people are angry. They use the F words, V words. They are swearing and shouting. Emotions can be expressed through what? Express emotion through words. Anger, frustration can be verbal expressed by swearing and shouting at someone. Then we have what? But before we, we move on, let, let's. No, we can move on. Emotions and various intensities. Emotions and what? And various intensities. The, the intensity of emotion varies on a continuum and ranging from extremely low to extremely high. Emotions vary. So it depends on how angry are you. And the intensity determines the level of anger. Or your level of what? Of joyfulness. It ranges from extremely low to extremely high. Depends on the circumstance or, or situation. What might make you happy? On a high degree, perhaps I'll see there's something that is normal. Maybe you, for you to go to school, you'll be extremely happy. Once you need say to you, you admitted for this qualification. You'll be extremely happy. You buy a car, you'll be extremely happy. However, some people, because they are used to it, or you don't want similar things, they might be happy, but not extreme. So emotional varies in intensity. So when you say emotional, you are referring to something that makes you happy or something that makes you sad. That's why it varies. Moving on, emotions, concept of emotion. Concept of emotion, with Emotions are feelings. We understand that. We experience a variety of feelings in our everyday lives. Emotions are feelings that are clearly linked to the meaning of a particular situation. Emotions are feelings that are clearly linked to a particular situation, like Raven said. You can only, you can only express certain feelings if something has triggered your behavior. Then component of emotion. For you to understand emotions, you need to break down the component. Component of emotion, your physiological components, cognitive components, behavioral components. 
let's start with what physiological components. Physiological components, like I've said, mostly physiological changes are internal. You cannot see them. Yes, they are physical, however, they are internal. Internal what happens to your body? They say physiological arousal associated with emotions occurs through the actions of autonomic nervous system. The first chapter, human nervous system. So for you to master all this chapter, you need to make sure that you go through human nervous system data. They say physiological arousal associated with emotions occur through the autonomic nervous system. Then what happens in the autonomic nervous system? Autonomic nervous system will regulate activities, activity of glands, smooth muscles, as well as blood vessels. They will activate glands. The glands like in our mind, we have pituitary gland, pituitary gland, PYC 1501, human nervous system, the first chapter, we have pituitary gland. Pituitary gland is responsible to stimulate specific hormones when we are in rush, flight or fight reaction. You see danger, you decide that you want to run. Certain glands will be activated, particularly Certain hormones will be activated, like adrenaline. Each time either you want to fight or you want to use our body more, more effectively, adrenaline will be stimulated, stimulated by what? By this by the gland, pituitary glands. Then they say it's regulated to smooth muscle, the flexibility, smooth muscles. Also, your blood vessels will either open or close, depending on depends on the situation. So when you say physiological re reaction, you are referring to the organs in your body. Organs that is your heart, your lungs. Those are the key organs when experiencing danger or something that excites you. You breathe high, want to breathe high, meaning your lungs are pumping. You there's there's high high level of blood flow. Blood flow happens where right? in your heart. Your heart pumps out blood in and out. Then there's a smooth muscle that is physiological, which is internally. Then you have what? Cognitive component. Cognitive component, cognitive starts from the mind. Cognitive starts from the mind. Emotions are highly personal. They say cognitive. Cognitive is your reasoning, a thinking process. You, you make sense through co cognitive aspects. They say emotions are highly personal and relate to subjective experiences. People cognitive process about events in their lives are therefore the key determinant of the emotions they experience. Emotions are personal. Yes, emotions are, experience, are, are personal. Right? What do you mean by emotions are, are personal? That what you see as danger, I might not see as danger. What you see as uh, being too much, I might not see as being too much. You might find that you make certain jokes about certain people. Perhaps it says one may take it lightly and laugh. Someone gets angry and tell you not to do that again, not, not to ever say that again. Then they say emotions are personal. Perhaps to me, buying a pair of sneakers is so emotional, I'm so excited. Due to certain experiences, you'll come and say, how can you be happy so much just because you bought a pair of shoes? No, it cannot be that because emotions are highly personal. They relate to one subjective experience. You cannot understand them unless the person tells you. People cognitive process, the way of thinking about events in their lives are therefore the key determinant of emotion. So whatever that affects you in your life are the key determinant of your cognitive aspects, meaning it's either you have experienced it before, that is cognitive, it's in your mind, or you fear it, the cognitive is in your mind. You're walking on the street, you see a snake, I run away. It's too fast in the street. It's driven and, and, and see ya. You, you both see a snake, I decide to run away. The Raven is surprised. Why are you running away? Because you're not supposed to do that. Perhaps Raven in this instance is more familiar with snakes, to manage snakes. He's more familiar with the type of snakes. Perhaps he, he, he can see that, no, no, no. This is not a, a dangerous snake. Perhaps a bush snake is not a dangerous snake. I can even hold it or remove it from the street. Instead, I will save the snake myself instead of running away. However, 
true to my experience, what they say, cognitive, my personal experience, I've never experienced something like that. I know that snakes are danger. Yeah, it's, when I say snake, I see danger. Subject experience, I've seen snakes beating people. I know that snake can beat. It's my subjective experience. However, if, and on the other hand, subjective experience know that no, it's snakes differ. Before you run away, you need to make sure that you protect yourself. Perhaps look aside, look aside. Don't face it directly. Or you do one, two, three in order to avoid danger. But however, I decided to run away. Me running away is due to my personal experience and my subjective experience. Ravens not running away again is based on, on his personal experience. The advantage he has with working with snakes. Then you have behavioral components. Behavioral components, the way you behave, they say emotions are usually expressed in body language. Emotions are usually expressed where? Through body language. You can see your expression of emotion through body language and non-verbal behavior. Emotions are usually expressed in body language and non-verbal behavior. Body language, either I'm running away or sweating, even urinating because they are scared. That's how some they will express their emotions. Then they say body gestures. Body gestures, that is body language. Body gestures as well as facial expression are used to show variety of emotional basis. Non-verbal non behavior. So almost the same thing. Moving on to the theories, theories of human behavior. The theory states that emotions, remember a theory, is a, a, a theoretical aspect or knowledge that has been built by someone who refer to them as theories. The theory states that Emotions okay when you apply a particular label to general physical arousal. The theory states that emotions okay when we apply a particular label to general physical arousal. The experiences of emotions, therefore, depends on the two factors. What are the two factors? Autonomic arousal as well as cognitive interpretation of that situation. The way we interpret events, the way we interpret in, in, uh, fear or the way we experience emotion depends on these two factors. The theory states that emotions occur when you apply a particular label to a general physical arousal. When you apply a particular label, again, let's use an example of the snake. I normally use an example of the snake because I think it's the most practical one for a carnivore. Any kind of or like a lion. They say the experience of emotion therefore depends on two factors. Factor number one, let's look at this one. Factor number one, cognitive appraisal. But we we'll try to link the two in order to make sense of them. We we'll try by only to link the two. So it says in, in, in this instance, you are walking in the streets, suddenly you see what? You see a lion. The lion in this instance is what? We are here. Cognitive interpretation. Remember, cognitive is all in the mind. You see, a lion. A lion is a form of a stimulation. It's what stimulates you. It's what triggers your mind. It's a stimulant. You see a lion. You want to see a lion? Something needs to happen in your body. They say arousal. You become aware. Here's the lion. Side in the arousal. In your mind, you label it. By labeling, you know that a lion can eat you, a snake can bite you, you can die. That is labeling. You label. So either you label it as danger or not danger. Arousal is a first contact. You It's an awareness that I mean danger. Meaning you arouse. You become alert of something. Stimulation. Stimulated by what, by what you see. Your mind is stimulated by what you see. Stimulation in this instance is a lion or snake. Arousal, your level of alertness. You have to stand still. 
you try to conceal in your mind, am I really seeing what I'm seeing? The alertness. You label. By labeling, this is the lion. What can I do? That emotions start to creep in. Never getting emotional. By emotional, you, are, you, are, you fear. <laughs> There's fear. There's fear. Uh, uh, in too much fear of the snake. That is emotion. Plus behavior. Behavior is when you act. It's either you, you shake, you cry, you, you urinate, or you run away. That's a behavior. So they've break it down, cognitive interpretation. The steps, what happens under cognitive interpretation? Stimulation is what you see. In this instance, you see what? You see a snake. Arousal, what happens within you? You, they, they, you become alert. That, this is the snake. The snake, you become aware that is a snake. You label. Once you label, is whether danger or you are safe. After labeling it, whether it's a danger, you're becoming emotional. You, we, we can now see your emotions. How do you see your emotions? Like I've said, it's either you cry or you sweat. Then behavior. Behavior is a decision that you take. The decision is either you run away or you fight the lion, if you have those means. Step by step, stimulation, arousal, label, emotion, and behavior. We call them two-factor theory. Two-factor theory, autonomic arousal and cognitive arousal. Autonomic arousal, remember, we explained it here. We said physiological arousal associated with emotions occur through the action of autonomic nervous system. What happened in the autonomic nervous system? Dense, smooth muscle, blood pressure, blood vessel, meaning the organs, the breathing rate is high. That is autonomous arousal. What happens to you internally? When you see danger, what happens to you, your body internal when you see danger? The theory, the theory claims that the component of physiological arousal and cognitive process are not equally important in the interpretation of emotion. Instead, the way we think results in emotions. Do you see this? This is cognitive theory. Cognitive theory, they, they are saying, no, we do agree with two-factor theory, however, the theory is not precise. It's, it's left, it left out certain important information according to cognitive appraisal. So it's two-factor theory. That is two-factor theory because of the two. Two-factor theory. Two-factor theory, they say, the theory states that emotions occur when you apply a particular label, that is, you label something, to a general physical arousal. The experience of emotions, therefore, depends on two factors. Two factors, what are those factors? Autonomic arousal as well as cognitive interpretation of arousal. Then comes cognitive appraisal and says, no, the theory claims that the component of physiological arousal and cognitive theory, the component of physiological arousal as well as what? Cognitive. Cognitive processes are not equally important in the interpretation of emotion. So they're, they're, they're saying these two are not equally important in the process of interpreting information. However, what is important is Instead, the way we think results in emotion. They say the way you think results in emotion. You can see a danger. However, the way you look at it and interpret it, that's when you can you can say it's either a danger or no danger, not a threat. You driving a car for the first time, someone might say, "Don't do that. You need to first prepare to get a lesson or proper. You need to sit next to someone." But you say, "No, no, no, no." That would happen because the way you think, you don't see a danger. As soon as you experience danger, you see it as danger. That's why you become emotional. In short, it's only it's only in the mind. When you fear something, that's why you can you can see the emotions. However, when you don't fear anything, you won't see the emotions. That's why you would find people do perhaps doing presentation or doing something for the first time, and they come to you and say, "I was so nervous." Then you get surprised, but I, I didn't see all of that. What do you mean that you're so nervous? Because I didn't see all of that. Then you have what you call emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, which is what? The concept of 
emotional intelligence, the concept, a concept of emotional intelligence, this is part of emotions. Yes, the emotional intelligence refers to a combination of skills, including empathy. What do you mean by empathy? Understanding what others are experiencing, putting yourself in other people's shoes, understanding what other people are experiencing, self-control, self-awareness, sensitivity to the feelings of others, persistence, keeping on going, even when the situation is difficult, self-motivation, doing things for yourself, not relying on other people to do things to motivate you, meaning you are self-motivated, you are independent-minded. That is empathy. However, all in all, it's emotional intelligence. They say emotional intelligence refers to a combination of skills, including empathy. By empathy, understanding what other people are experiencing, self-control, having self-control, being self-aware, sensitivity to the feelings of others and persistence, keep, keeping on going even when the situation is difficult, self-motivated, doing things for yourself, not relying on others. That is self-independent. The abilities of people with high self control How do we see people that they, 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 they what they have high? How do we see people with high emotional intelligence? They motivate themselves and keep on trying in the face of frustration. They control impetus, impulses. They control impulses and delay gratification. They control impulses. What do you mean by control impulses? When some when someone upsets you, you don't just behave haphazardly without thinking. So you think first, then you apply something. They say they control impulses. They don't just act and they delay gratification. They regulate moods and do not allow emotions to interfere with their, their ability to think. They don't allow emotions to affect their ability to think. They recognize emotions in others and they have what? They have hope. People who die high emotional intelligence. So in short, high intelligence is an ability to control your, your emotions, regardless of what happens. The ability to hold your emotions, the ability to think of others. You don't just hurt haphazardly, impulsive, and put yourself into danger and other people into danger. So this is the last one under emotions, the interpretation of, emo of emotion. Interpretation of emotion from Gender aspect. Please close your close the mic at the back. Close the mic. We can hear you. We say gender in emotions. Gender in emotions. Women have a reputation of being more emotional than men. That's an interpretation. They say women have a reputation of being more emotional than men. However, in actual facts, so me and you, or the word from the street, you normally hear that the society believes that women have a, a reputation of being more emotional. In short, they say women are more emotional compared to men. However, in, in psychology, because now you are, you are psychology students, you have a broader knowledge. In, in short, they say no, that cannot be the case as always. They say, however, in fact, however, in fact, men usually suppress their emotions whereas men are more open about their emotions. Therefore, both men and women, they are emotional in nature. We are born emotional, both men and women. The difference is that women have mastered the art of expressing their emotions, whereas men, mostly they suppress their emotions. However, uh, when, when you use a psychological scale, an emotional scale, we can easily see that both men and women are emotional. What if us here? the way they express their emotion. Women express their emotion if it openly, whereas men, they suppress. However, when you use an emotional scale, you can easily see that both men, males, both males and females are emotional beings in nature. They say cultural differences in emotional experience. Cultural differences in emotional experience, they say, there are also cultural differences in the way people think about and interpret, express emotions, as well as the way that differences culture and groups emotional. From, like you said, from culture to culture, we express emotions differently. From culture to culture, we express emotions differently. For instance, we can go back to gender. If as a man you cry, they see you as, as weak compared to a female. 
the expect men to hold the household compared to the female. So that is emotion. The ex most of the time, cultural differences, emotion, we, we expect that, that if your children do something bad, you need to perhaps uh, punish them physically. You need to show your emotions that they've done something bad. Whereas in other cultures, they discuss. You discuss, you open yourself, you, you open up about the, the feelings from culture to culture. Some culture they say, no, you don't need to talk to your children. Some culture say, no, 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 no. In order to solve the family issues, you, you to manage your child's behavior, you need to talk, open up, sit down and talk, take your child out. Some culture say, no, 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 they, that child will be disrespectful. Then from context, context of emotion, they say, Knowledge of the context, circumstances in which an emotion is expressed is, is important in, in accurately understanding and interpretation of the expressed emotion. Knowledge of the context. Firstly, before you, this, this from context to context, emotions differ. In a funeral, emotions differ. In a wedding, emotions differ. In a funeral, we expect you to be sad, not laughing, not being joyful because we'll see you as insensitive. And from context to context, from the way you're expressing your emotions differ. The way you communicate with your parents differ from the way you communicate with what? With your friends. The way you express your emotions differ from context to context. They say knowledge of the context or circumstance in which an emotion is expressed is important. Accurately understanding the interpretation of expressed emotions. From, from event to event, we, ex we expect certain emotions. Currently, graduations are taking place. They are trending. Videos are trending. You see, parents are so excited about their daughter, their son graduating, meaning we cannot re re reprimand them of coming and dancing in the stage. Yes, we can reprimand them. Not, don't do that. However, we cannot open a case or chase them away or throw them out of the stage. But it's expected in this context. Yeah. Yes, now and again, we have securities yes. next to We have personnel who can deal with those. Context of emotion from various aspects. So for now, we are done with what? Emotion. So we start here. Cognition. Cognition is divided into three chapters. Chapter number one, problem solving, reasoning, and thinking. Problem solving, reasoning, as well as thinking. Now we are discussing what? The first one, that is? problem solving. But before we continue, we need to be able to define the term, the term cognition. Like I've said, cognition is the process of thinking and reasoning. So process of thinking and reasoning, it's the steps in the process of problem solving. Number one, steps in the process of problem solving. In order to solve the problem, we need to apply certain steps. Step number one, identify the problem and define it clearly. You need to identify the problem and define it clearly. Uh, like Dr. Phil says, the first step to recover is to admit that you have a problem. If you don't see a problem in yourself, then it's difficult to get either psychological intervention or any form of intervention. You need to see the problem in you. Another example would be you want to assist someone through re rehabilitation, putting someone into the rehabilitation process due to the overuse of drugs, substance, drug use. You want to help the person. However, you find it hard to assist the person because the person does not see a problem with him or herself. That's why you find that perhaps the nyaupe, someone who's smoking, smoking nyaupe in your family or neighbor, you will take the person to rehab, perhaps by force, either manipulation or by force. The person go, does go to rehab, he comes back a man, Suddenly, the person smokes again. Comes back six months, six months in the rehabilitation process. Comes back, the person goes back to smoke, meaning the person has not yet identified the problem with his or her behavior. They say the first step to recovering, to deal with your, your problem, is to identify to, and admit that you have a problem. They say identify the problem and define it clearly. That is example number one. Example number two would be. You are given a problem to solve. You as a psychologist, remember only a psychologist, a provincial psychologist, you're also a 
a tourist the researcher. They call you, one of the company calls you and say you are experiencing a problem with absenteeism. Let's use absenteeism. They said you are experiencing a problem with absenteeism and you'd like you to assist us in dealing with absenteeism in our workplace. Then you go to a place, do some consultations, then you start working. Your job is to identify why are they having absenteeism now and again. You need to take, diagnose the workplace. But to how? Through observation. You observe the employees, you speak to them. In that process of the interview, perhaps you pick up things like people are absent because they are not well emotionally. The treatment in the workplace is not conducive. That is one reason. You'll find that they are being absent now and again because of their health issues. Their health issues related to what? Perhaps a dustbin, could be a dustbin next to the building windows. People are always suffocating. They are catching flu, but no one is away. Perhaps the paint in the room is affecting them. So it could be psychological effects, the treatment in the workplace. Some they are not they don't feel welcome in the workplace, or physical things like the smell. Then they get sick. Now when they get sick, now they again they'll come up with, with, with the doctor's notes. Perhaps you're overworking them. As a manager, perhaps you're overworking the employees. So it's difficult to deal with their health issues. So your job is to identify those problems. They say absenteeism is a problem. However, it, it is not a core problem. There's an underlying problem that caused the people, caused most of the employees to be absent. That is identifying the problem and defining it, defining it clearly. As soon as you submit the reports to the people who hired you, the employers, now if you identify the problem, that is due to one, two, three. You, meaning you have money to identify the problem, you, you can define it clearly. Then once you have defined the problem, Step number two, how are you planning to solve it? How are you planning to solve the problem? Explore various strategies. They say you need to explore a various strategies on how are you planning to solve the problem. Are you going to solve the problem through trial and error approach or heuristic approach, heuristic strategy? Are you going to apply a trial and error approach or, or heuristic strategies? A trial and error approach, they say, trying all possible or more or less uh, solution, less randomly. Trying all possible more or less randomly, the solutions. What do they mean by that? It's trying all possible solution. Can you apply in this context? So trial and error. Trial and error to solving a problem is called mechanical approach because it involves applying a set of rules and, and, and discovery by route. Trial and error thinking involves trying all possible or more or less randomly. For example, you know that one of the keys in the bunch of fits a particular lock. So let me make an example here. The example of the key is the most likely solution. Um, we are a security in the company. If not a security, yeah, we are a manager in the company. Some of the employees lock themselves in the toilet by mistake or lock themselves themselves in, in the kitchen by mistake. You don't know the keys. Yeah, let's say you're a manager. You don't know the keys. The securities know the keys much better. Before you leave the, the premises, you can hear the knock. Help, help. Someone is locked on the door. You phone the securities. There's no way that they can come and rescue these people. However, they direct you. Go and collect the keys in our office. Then you go there and collect the keys. Once you collect the keys, you don't know which specific key can unlock the kitchen door or the toilet door. How many keys are there? We'll assume that you have how many? 50 keys. You don't know of the specific key. So when they say, try all possible or more or less randomly, try all possible solution, meaning you'll try each key one by one. You'll try each key one by one. They say trial and error involves trying all possible solution. Or less random. For example, you know that of, you know that of the keys in the pan fit the lock, but you do not know which one fits the lock. You try an error approach would be to try each one of the key in order. One by one, you try the key. That is 
challenge error approach, time all possible solution. Then heuristic, heuristic strategy which defines the site, they say, try the likeliest solution first and reduce to the alternative that have to be considered. We try the likeliest solution first and reduce the alternative that has been considered. So normally, try the likeliest solution in the, using the key. What we, what we do is that normally people they will look at they will look at the key and compare the whole, the handle door, the, the door handle. They look they will look at the, the the key the key handler, or we can say a door handle and look at the key, the, the, the sizes and shape of the key are different. The sizes and shapes of the key, normally, they differ. So you need to check the likeliest key to enter because of the shape and the size. How big the hole is compared to the key? How does the key shape compared to, to the door? Yes, it's much easier. You, you, you check the first key, no, 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 no. This one won't fit. You take the second key, this one will fit. So you, 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 you try to use all the likeliest, they say the likeliest solution, the key that they might fit. That is hierarchic strategies. They say once you, once you are done in choosing the possible solution, they say explore the possible solution. Explore the possible solution that you do it practically now. You put the key to unlock the door. You're doing it what? Practically. Then you open the door. Four, evaluate and learn from the solution. You evaluate and learn from the solution. It may happen that each potential solution will try give rise to another problem. They say it may happen that the more you try yeah, this solution, it gives rise to, to an other problems. But again, you can deal with each one until you find a, a satisfactory solution. You have to assess each of the solution to find out whether it has solved effectively. So do any problems, there are challenges. So they, they say the more you try to unlock the door, there will be challenges. Challenges will be perhaps one of the key gets damaged or breaks inside the door lock. Now you don't have a choice but to break the door. If not break the door, that's why you decide to call the locksmith. They say the more you try these solutions, they might lead to another challenge. However, you learn from that solution. That is problem solving, steps in problem solving. Identify the problem and define it clearly. Explore various strategies. In this case, the strategies that I recommend, trial and error, trying all possible solutions, heuristic strategies, trying the likeliest solution first and reduce the alternative that has to be considered. Explore possible solution. Now you are sure that you are either using they are either using heuristic or trial and error. Explore possible solutions. That's it. You choose one. Evaluate. The more you try to solve the problem, there could be some challenges. However, you learn from them. They say another way, process of solving the problem is through the insights. Using your what? Using your insights. They say a state is insight is a state by an answer to the problem appears suddenly, and you wonder why did we not see it before. A state whereby an answer to a problem appears suddenly, and you wonder why you didn't see it before. An example here would be, you are in a group discussion or a group meeting, team building. You are trying to solve a problem. However, it is challenging to solve the problem now, because perhaps your mind is stuck somewhere. Then you, you proceed and focus on other things. However, the more you 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 proceed and focus on other things silently one person within the group finds an answer they say a state by an answer to a problem appears suddenly we wonder why you did not see it before you see that your car is stuck now and again you've been trying to to solve to find the the, the problem in a car suddenly one person perhaps was passing and say what are you looking for now we are trying to start the car. This, the guy said, I can see the, the screw. The screw underneath the car. Perhaps that's a problem. Then we take the screw. Oh, man. I didn't notice. That's what normally happens. You lost something in the house. You've been looking for it. Now and again, you can't find this. 
someone says, but you've been holding it. It's in your, in your trouser. You, you, I saw it outside in the car. Then you say, oh, I didn't notice. So I stayed up and answer to a problem appear suddenly. We wonder why you didn't notice it before. Then we have what? The restricted thinking. Restricted thinking, like the way it says, restricted, restricted, limited. Something that is fixed. A mental set that allows you not to find the solution to a problem. They say, sometimes you seem to get stuck in our thinking. Sometimes you seem to get stuck in our thinking. We cannot find a solution to a problem. We may be unable to see the alternative in that particular moment. One of the explanations of why we get stuck is that mental set, fixation. Fixation is an example of restricted thinking. Another way of describing it is a tendency to evaluate a problem in a particular way that restricts your thinking. Sometimes we find ourselves in, in situation whereby we try to solve certain issues, but it's difficult to solve certain, certain issues due to these aspects, emotional barrier, land barrier, perceptual barrier, and cultural barrier. We get stuck to these forms of barrier. Let's start with barrier number one, barrier in emotional barrier. Yes, sometimes you are unable to solve problems because our emotions get in the way of our thinking clearly. Sometimes we are unable to solve our problem because our emotions get into a way. You're trying to solve the problem, but people now and again that tell you, don't be too emotional because you, you won't be able to solve the problem. The more you're emotional, the more the situation becomes worse. Sometimes you are unable to solve problems because our emotions get in the way of our thinking. For example, the fear of being embarrassed. The fear of being embarrassed there's an opportunity for you to present in class. You have an answer, a correct answer, because, but because you fear in standing up in front of the class, you are too anxious. That, that is emotional period, meaning it will hinder your success. It will stop you from doing your presentation. It will stop you from expressing yourself. Emotional period, because you don't want to make mistakes. You're too cautious about yourself. Emotional period, and you end up not achieving what you intend to achieve. Then land barrier. Land barrier, we may think that something can only be done in one way because that is the way we have learned. Say land barrier. We may think that there's only one way of doing things because that's how we have learned. Mo mo mostly traditional, uh, traditional teachings of old people, old, old, old people, they'll tell you. Uh, at times, you might find going to a new place, you'll find people who have been working there for years. Then you try to come up with alternative. Then they tell you, no, 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 this is what has been done for years. You can't tell us what to do. We've been doing this for years. You see now, uh, due to COVID, besides COVID, the world is, is technological. We're moving through globalization. Technology influences everything. Internet and, and technology influences everything, meaning you cannot stick in land barrier. You need to move out from the comfort zone. So land barrier are those people who say, we have been doing this for years. There's nothing can be changed. At times they are correct. There's nothing can be changed. At times you find that there is a challenge. It needs to be solved. And the barrier is this, is this. we have learned this for years. Then you end up not achieving the problem. That is restricted thinking. Perceptual barrier, they say, sometimes you tend to see only one aspect of the problem and ignore the others. Sometimes you tend to see one aspect of the problem and ignore others. Our cultural values may lead us to believe that re that reason and logic, no, perceptual barrier, I'm reading uh, something wrong, they say, sometimes you tend to see only one aspect of the problem and we ignore the others. This can get into a way of solving the problem. At times you find that perceptual barrier, there is a problem. However, perceptual barrier is influenced by the way of perception. You see a one way of doing something. They say sometimes you tend to see only one aspect of the problem and ignore the others. However, you'll find that the problem, the real problem is what you are avoiding. Cultural barriers. Our cultural values may lead us to believe that the, that reasons and logic are best means of solving problems. 
our cultural values may lead us to believe that the, that reason and logic are the best means of solving the problem. That is reasoning and logic are the best means of solving the problem. And fantasy and play are, are a waste of time. In this way, we do not explore the various ways of solving a problem. Again, traditional issues. Believing, believing that the only way of doing this is that, not the other way, due to cultural barriers. You are stuck in your traditional barriers. Then what is reasoning? The reason. Reasoning. We have reasoning and thinking. Let's start with thinking. Let's start with thinking. But I will involve you here. Before we continue, I would like to know, according to your understanding, is there a difference between thinking and reasoning? Students, is there a difference between thinking and reasoning? And what is the difference? They say thinking and reasoning. What's the difference between thinking and reasoning? And anyone, what's the difference between the two concepts? Uh, thank you. Um, I think, think reasoning is way by one approaches or goes back to what they learn from to learned experiences or possible what you call learned experiences and applying them to the present and then using those experiences to solve or to approach a certain situation, solve a problem or approach a certain situation. Okay. Thank Whereby you. thinking is um you 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 are looking at what could happen if I do this. If it happens in this way, what possible could transpire if I push this lever on this side, how much force will it apply on the other side and what could possibly break or pop out? That's what I'm thinking. Okay, as soon as you make a decision, that's where you reason, you apply it. Yes. Oh, thanks very much. That's a good explanation. Thanks, Busiso. So the Busiso is, say, is saying the difference between thinking and reasoning. The Busiso is saying the difference between the two. Let's start with thinking. Thinking is your thoughts. It's a thinking process. Your thoughts is a thinking process. Most of the time, we cannot see your thinking. Not most of the time, we cannot see your thinking. Because you think, you think internally. Mostly, it's your thoughts. That's why when you suddenly you keep quiet, we'll ask you, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Because we cannot see it. You have to say, what are you thinking about? So most is a thought process. Whereas reasoning, Reasoning, you can see reasoning because it has to do with what, like the Busiso said, it has to do with what application. I'm giving you a class now. Starting, I say to you, let's do a test or oh, ask you a question. Okay, let me show you not, not a class. All along, I was presenting a class, meaning when I present a class, you apply your thinking, you're trying to reason. Uh, we apply thinking. What it says trying to say is that. What it says trying to say is that. I ask you a question. Before you answer, most of you were quiet. Meaning, you are doing what? You are, you, are, you are trying to think. The difference between thinking and reasoning. You are trying to apply your mind. What the difference between the two concepts? That is thinking. I cannot see it. And this, and, until the busiso raise up the hand and <clears throat> sort of about that and start talking, then I can assess the busiso reasoning. That's Busiso said, said this, meaning I can measure his reasoning. So reasoning is, the, is an application. You, you think, once you're done thinking, you put it in, into practice. How do you put it into practice? You put it into practice through reasoning. I ask what's the difference between the two. You think reasoning won't explain it to me. And I can feel that the answer is making sense. That is reasoning. So thanks, thanks very much. So that was the accurate explanation. So reasoning is a process that you, it, the deliberate action. I can measure your, your reasoning through talking, through writing a test, through setting certain concepts that now, now he's reasoning. But thinking, I cannot see your thinking. I cannot see your thoughts until you put them into practice. As soon as you put them into practice, that is reasoning. So they start, they say reasoning and thinking. Reasoning. Reasoning, the structure of reasoning. The structure of reasoning, they say, relationship between a premise and a conclusion. You can determine the reasoning through a premises and a conclusion. 
normally premise is a statement that supports the conclusion. A statement that supports the conclusion. They say the relationship between reasoning and conclusion. We we'll start about this in English. You also find these concepts under what? Philosophy. Philosophy, critical reasoning. Philosophy. They say the relationship between a premise. The statement supports the conclusion. A premise provides the evidence that supports the conclusion. When you say it will rain tonight, I can see that it will rain tonight. It's what? It's a premise, a statement. Then automatically it rains. They say that's a relationship, that's a structure of, of, of reasoning. That's a structure of this. There should be a statement and evidence. A premise provides the evidence that supports the conclusion. Then move on, on our right hand side too. They say reasoning is based on formal rules of logic. Reasoning is based on formal rules and logic. We have deductive reasoning as well as inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning, the first one they say, refers to the process of drawing a conclusion that follows logically from two or more statements and premise. It refers to the process of drawing a conclusion that follows logically from two or more premises. That is, that is deductive reasoning, a process whereby drawing a conclusion from a premise. The premise could be one or two. Does your premise, like I've said, it will rain tonight and eventually it rains. The question will be, does your premise support your conclusion? Yes, because it did rain. And then have inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, they say, uses available evidence to generate a conclusion about the likelihood of something, about the likelihood that something will happen. Same, re same reasoning as this. You are saying it will rain tonight. Why are you saying it will rain tonight? Tonight, Because I can see it's, it's cloudy. It's cloudy. Chances are it's going to rain. So no, normally you associate cloudy and changing of weather. Chances it to rain. They say uses available evidence to generate a conclusion about the likelihood of something to happen. Meaning it might happen, it might not happen due to the likelihood. When it's cloudy, it's high likely that it rain inductive reasoning. Then we move to what? We move to formal and informal reasoning. Formal reasoning, the premise is stated clearly. The premise is stated what? Clearly. Is expressed clearly. Whereas in formal reasoning, they are more implied than explicit. They are more implied than explicit. So these questions, they like them in your know, test because they're a bit confusing. They must say to you, in the statement, what is the deductive reasoning? In the statement, what is the deductive reasoning? Then they put a statement that relates to formal. They put a statement that relates to informal as well as inductive. They give you four statements. They say to you, in the statement, which statement represents deductive reasoning? That's how they phrase it. Then we move on. We move on to fallacy. Fallacy. They say playing on someone's sympathy to get something done. Playing on someone's sympathy to get something done. That is fallacy. What do they mean by playing on someone's sympathy to get things done? They've given us an example. They say, for example, a student who fails an exam asks the lecturer to give him a pass mark because. He has difficult personal circumstances. We give you an exam, give an assignment to do. You fail the assignment. You you either phone a lecture or send an email that can kindly give me a pass mark because I have personal circumstances. You know, you're playing on someone's sympathy. Why you do it? I would say you're playing on someone's sympathy. You getting a poor, poor. This is a poor reasoning because students' personal circumstances are not relevant to the criteria of passing an exam. Many students have personal or difficult circumstances, but they do master the exam. Again, if you have a personal circumstance, what you need to do normally, you provide a note. A personal circumstance could be that there was death in your family, 
you provide a certificate instead of sending a lecture email that you, you request a pass mark. And the four way of doing it, you rewrite. You don't just get a, mark, a pass mark, you write an exam, not to rewrite actually. <clears throat> you apply for an accreditation. If you are sick, you provide with us with a, you will provide the institution with the doctor's note as an evidence. We don't just send an email and say, you request a what? A pass mark. That is fallacy in reasoning. You play on someone else's sympathy. Two, they say trying to discredit an issue by discrediting the person who supports the issue. Trying to discredit the issue by discrediting the person who supports the issue. For example, you may say you do not believe what a person says because you do not like the person's appearance. Here, in short, you just being judgmental. You just being judgmental. You get a something. You you get a, a news or someone is sharing information to you. However, because you don't like the person, you don't believe in the story, or you undermine the person, you don't believe in the story. Then you go out. Another person person tells you the story. Then you start to believe it. You know those instances. You you advise someone close to you. you don't do this because. This is what will happen. And the person says to you, OK, and proceed and do that thing. Later, later in the stage, he comes back to you and say, you know, my friend, what happened? Sipo told me to do one, two, three, and eventually it worked. Only to think about it, you, 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 you were the first to advise him to do that. However, he or she didn't take your advice. You see that time they say you're trying to discredit an issue by discrediting the person who says it. The third one, they say re relying on the characteristics of a certain group in order to gain support for a particular condition. Relying on a on the characteristics of a certain group in order to gain support for a particular conclusion. For example, an advertisement who says that a real men drink beer. No man will see that they say real men drink beer through the advertisement. So this advert they say is playing on the sentiments of men who want to be seen as men. So you'll find that most of the time in the streets, it's less, you'll find less people, especially men, drinking what? Water <laughs> in the streets, drinking what juice in the streets. But most men will find drinking beer. Why is that? It's because of, they say, relying on the characteristics. Because you assume that when you carry a beer in the street, when you're carrying what you're calling good, you are, you are seen as manly. Compare carrying a glass of water. You will see, you will see as sissy. <laughs> that is the, a, the most practical example. They say rely, relying on the characteristics of a certain group. You want to be seen as manly. You want to fit in the society in order to gain a support for a particular conclusion that you are a man, you are a real man. Then you avoid doing certain things like carrying water or shoes in the streets because people will say to you, what is he doing? In, in, in society, they say, what is he doing carrying water in the streets? The real man carries a beer. The fifth, fourth one, they say using fallacy analogy, using a, a false analogy. Using a false analogy means applying that things that are similar are actually identical. Implying that things that are similar are actually identical. What do they mean by things that are similar are actually identical? Look at the following examples. Norms and her husband, they're giving us an example. They say to us, please listen carefully. Norms and her husband and is happy to be a housewife. If you would rather work than be a housewife, then you do not love your husband. You see the fathers. They say Nomsa loves her husband and is a happy housewife. Because Nomsa he, he loves her husband is a housewife, then they assume that if Nomsa, if you would rather work than be a housewife, then you don't love your husband. Then they, they imply that if Nomsa decides to go to work, it, it will, they will say Nomsa does not love, love what her husband because it decides to work. That is what? 
using false analogy means imp implying things that are, are, are similar but not actually identical. Using a certain issue, you are arguing with someone, then makes an example that is irrelevant to the context of the argument, trying to avoid the real issue here, using false analogy. Or using a slightly changed version of someone else. And they also say, using a slightly changed version of someone else's point of view as the basis of your reasoning. Using a slightly changed version of someone else's point of view as a basic form of a reasoning. What do they mean by that? They say, for example, Mary says, Mary says she can understand that some people have reasons for agreeing with abortion. For example, Mary says she can understand. Perhaps you're arguing with the same people, not arguing, you are sharing a conversation. Then I suddenly say, we are, we are, talk, we are talking about abortion. Then I suddenly say, but I do understand. It makes sense why some people are voting about their children. It makes sense why, why, why other people do commit suicide. You are talking, it's me and me. Then you change the statement by saying, Sam then claims that Mary is in favor of abortion by saying, I understand why people are committing suicide. I understand why people are doing abortion. Suddenly, they say, I'm in favor of abortion. That is, using a slightly changed version of someone's else point of view as a basis for your reasoning. Normally, this happens in journalism. Journalism, they call you for an interview, you express yourself, then the newspaper come. They twist the whole story to suit their needs, to suit their target audience, to make money. The critical reasoning, we are closing it now, soon. Critical reasoning, identifying the problem. Critical reasoning, keeping an open mind. How do you apply critical reasoning? You apply critical reasoning to identifying the problem. You need to keep an open mind. Remember the difference between language and reality. Use open-ended questions. Avoid overgeneralization. Be specific. Avoid overgeneralization. Be empathic. Obtain relevant information. Use informal knowledge. Not always you have to use formal reasoning. We use formal knowledge. Develop what collective thinking. Develop collective thinking. Okay, let me sum up this. This is the last session for today. Thinking. Thinking, they say the nature of thoughts. How do we think? We think through what? Through images. Remember, when you think most of the time, you are quiet. So you are trying to make sense of what is said. When I ask what is the difference between thinking and reasoning, you use your imagination. You try to, to recall certain events. We think quite We think through images. Images are symbolic representation of objects and their characteristics. Images. When when I try, I try to. I look. I'm looking for directions. Use images to direct me. You think. You imagine the rules. Then they say you think through concepts. The categories we form as mental representation of the groups of related items called concepts. Mental representations. Those are the concepts in our mind. You say hierarchical, hierarchical organization of concepts using concepts is a form of thinking that classifies things in our world and makes sense of it. Using concepts is a form of thinking that classifies things in our world and makes sense of it. Two, racial organizational concepts. Then we have conceptual rules. They say we rely on conceptual rules to decide whether or not to do something beyond a certain concept. Before we do things, remember, you are, you're thinking, let's say you're arguing someone or you're seeing something. You think, you apply what your thinking process. However, you decide what to say. They say, yes, they say, think before you think. You don't just talk. You think, then you decide, no, 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 this will harm this person. Let me rather keep quiet. They say, we rely on conceptual rules to decide whether or not to, to do something beyond a certain concept. So it's conceptual rules. We think and, and decide, no, let, let me rather keep quiet. They say, Conceptual areas, conceptual areas, inaccurate, inaccurate use of concepts can lead to errors in thinking. Inaccurate use of concepts can lead to areas, e errors in thinking. Inaccurate use, inaccurate use of concepts. That is, e.g., stereotypes, discrimination, stereotypes, impurities can lead to errors in thinking. 
inaccurate use of concept can lead to errors in thinking. Zulus are like this, whites are like this. That's a stereotype. They say prototypes, prototypes, concept formation, and I did models of concepts. I did models of concepts, concept formation, and I I I did models of of concepts. The, the process of concept of formation is part of the mind attempt to function economically. That is minimizing the process of time and effort whenever possible. So when you try to solve a problem, the same prototype. For example, if you look at an apple, the first thing that comes into your mind is that an apple is an apple rather than a fruit. A fruit. And so when you see an apple, you think of an apple, you won't say fruit. That's how it comes to is a prototype, meaning I the, the mind attempts the, the, the thing that you associate with certain things. When you see 135, you think of what? You think of BMW. When I say to an M3, you think of not just the car, you think of the brand BMW. That is prototype. When I say to you conflicts, you think of the morning meal, you think of the breakfast more than anything else. That is prototype. You don't think of the various type of conflict. So I eat all brands, I eat what, I eat kennels. You instead you think of one thing, it's a breakfast. I need to, to eat prototype, meaning you become more specific. Then the last one, last one for today is language. Thinking and reasoning. We think and reasoning through what? Through the uses of language. Without language, won't be interaction. Thinking process won't make sense. We think through language. We have to learn how to speak, how to speak certain language. Imagine we are born without interacting with other people. We don't know anything about language. We're just living. Chances won't be able to even to talk because we're not taught how to speak. To speak, you speak through a certain language. So language is in two ways. They say there's inner speech. The inner speech, we, we cannot see it, but you, the ability to talk to yourself, the, the, the ability to make decisions in your mind. They say it's thinking. Thinking meaning is influenced by the inner speech. I look at you, I start interpreting things in my mind, thinking process through the inner speech. They say language is in thought. Inner speech is happening through what? The thoughts in a form of a language. Without language, nothing will happen. OK, I can see there's no hand. Colleagues, I'm done on my side. Thanks very much.